stay, would you please stand as you're able as we sing, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. everyone this morning. It's been a cold weekend. The lots are clear, and so I'm so pleased that y'all came out today. Um, just a couple of announcements. Um, I know I saw Bev this morning. She's down in the nursery right now, but I saw Bev earlier. as She was handing out um, giving statements for taxes for the year. Um, those are, if you've given to our offering, through our offering plate, you, she has one of those for you. Um, but if you have given online, uh, that process is taking a little longer. We will have those by the end of the month. So in the next two weeks, we'll have the online. So in other words, if you've given through offering plate and online, you'll get two separate statements. Now, um, because generosity who processes those are sending those directly to us. Now, if, you're, if you have an appointment that you're getting your taxes done yet this month and, and you have to have um, your statement sooner on the online, See me, I can show you how to log in and you can get it. But if, if you can wait two weeks, in the next two weeks, you'll have that statement. 
if that makes sense, okay? Um, I want to typically, before we collect our offering, I speak a little bit about something that our offering supports, so the different things, our missions and, and the food pantry and different things that our mission supports. But today's message, um, we're focusing on sanctity of human life. It's a Sunday that, that, that Baptists throughout the country, thousands of churches participate in. And, and, um, and so today, um, we're gonna, our message is going to be talking about that. And so we're not going to focus on that so much before the offering. And so um, before we do our offering, if you would um, just go with me in prayer. Okay? Father God, we thank you for this day to, to worship. It's a song day we come to, to worship, Lord. Lord, help us to have hearts of worship this morning. To have hearts open to what you would have us receive, that, that our songs, our, our prayers would be pleasing to you, Lord. Lord, as we look at a, a text this morning that, that we don't often talk about in church, discuss an issue that we don't often talk about on a weekly basis this morning, guide our hearts, Lord. Lord, let the day be pleasing to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, if you are helping with the offering, I would invite you to come forward this time. Kenny Abbott, would you pray for us? Father, as we come before you to give a portion of that which you have given to us, Heavenly Father. May you use this, Heavenly Father, for the furtherance of your ministry. And may we join you in your work. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, it's always interesting when you learn about different people's talents. You know, learning that, that people, some, maybe someone paints or, or different things that you never knew they did. And, and I had that experience this week. I was meeting with Morgan and Sue Miller, and, um, and I, I, we were talking about this Sunday's worship. And I said, this week's the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. We'll, we'll be talking about that a little bit. And he says, you know, he said, I like to write poetry. How many of you knew that Morgan writes poems? And his wife's probably one of the few back there, right? Um, and he said, I wrote a poem a while back about that. And, and so he sent it to me. And so I've asked if he would, would read that now and then before we go back into our singing. So if, if Morgan, if you would come now and, and share that with us. The title of this poem is Unborn and Undone. <coughs> a fundamental right, the gals would say, a constitutional right is Roe v. Wade. It's good for me, it's good for you, and it's good for all society too, the argument goes. Care for the vets, care for the widows, care for the tan-colored cat on a pillow. Be kind to the boss and to the patron at the counter. Help those with flat tires and bee sting encounters. But of the little ones inside of their mothers, they say, just to bother they are, the less babies the better. And when this procedure is over, you are best to forget it. God holds in his hand the souls that are made, that given the chance could have believed on his name, could have gone to birthday parties or climbed a great tree, felt the warmth of the sun, or had a sister to tease. But to the millions that died, nameless, obscure, they are now in God's hand, forever secure.
Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Stand again as you're able as we sing Shout to the North.
Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all.
today we join with tens of thousands of churches throughout the United States as we recognize Sanctity of Life Weekend. We proclaim that human life begins at conception and therefore is worthy of protection. This coming Saturday, um, the 22nd of January, marks the infamous anniversary of the 1973 Supreme Court decision legalizing the murder of unborn children. 49 years ago. It's a long time ago. I want to share some stats with you that, that I hope don't just stay in your, in your head, but they make it to your heart as well today. There's approximately 1.1 million abortions each year in the United States. On average, that's, that's one baby's life ending every 20 seconds. Since Roe versus Wade, there's been over 62 million babies that have not been allowed their first breath. That's actually, if you combine some of our, our lower state populations, that's the equivalent of 27 states in the United States. And nearly one in four, 22% actually, of pregnancies end in abortion today. 50% of, of women who seek abortion have had at least one previous abortion. And approximately a third of women in the United States have had an abortion by the age of 45. To put these stats into perspective, for, for every American soldier that has ever died in battle, and that, that's from the, the time of our country, from 1775 to today, there has been 91 abortions. Again, that's since 1970. Now, let me pause. Before we go much further, please know that there is no sin beyond God's forgiveness. If you've had an abortion, there's forgiveness, there's healing in this for you. If you've paid for an abortion, you can find forgiveness in the one who paid for our sin. Now, you may be wondering, what is this? We've been talking about growing the last couple of weeks. We've been talking about sermons on growing. What does this have to do with growing? And I truly believe it has everything to do with it. Two weeks ago, we, we learned that we must develop the practice of growing by, by standing firm, by becoming stubbornly faithful, and by sacrificing fully in 2022. And last week, we talked about the paradox of growing as we established that, that we have more than we think when we offer the little that we have. And today, today we're going to discover that we must maintain the right posture of growth by, by living our lives with conviction and purpose, fulfilling the unique roles that God has for each of us. And before we dive into the text today, let me give you a, a, just a few comments. Let me give you the sermon in a nutshell. If I were to summarize it in the one line, it would be, use your influence to make an impact. Now, influence refers to the, the power to change or to affect something or someone. You know, in our society, we like to, to celebrate different difference makers, don't we? Time magazine every year has a person of the year who, for better or for worse, has done the most to influence the events of that year. A number of years ago, Christianity Today highlighted 50 women you should know. They showcased influential Christian women who are making an impact in politics and in the church and in public life in general. Well, today we're going to be talking through our text about some extremely influential women who made incredible impacts. I believe there is a special calling that God places upon women on the issue of abortion and We'll talk about men at the end as well. Today we're going to see how God used women of different ages and stages of life to stand up for life. So let me give you a back, some background for our text before we get there today. In our text today, the Israelites are in Egypt and to avoid a severe famine. And they've, they've begun to multiply greatly. A new king has come to power and, and he's, he, he became threatened by this increase of the Israelites. There's just so many of them. We read about this in, in Exodus 1, 12 through 14. It says, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the field. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. As we move through the rest of this passage today, I see four pro-life roles in this text. And as we go through each one, I encourage you to ask God, what, 
what role is God calling you to play in order to use your influence to make an impact? First point today. Save those who can't save themselves by fearing God. We see this in the first verses of our text this morning. After the Pharaoh did everything he could to, to make life miserable for the Israelites, he eventually turns to euthanasia. Now let's pick up in verse 15 of our text today. Verse 15, it says, The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, since there, since there were no OB doctors back then, it was common for a woman to use a midwife. The, the, the word literally means one who helps to bear. Now the names of these women, we have Shifra, which means beautiful or brightness, and then we have Pua, which means blossom or splendor. It's interesting to note that their names are given to us in this text, but, but we don't see the name of the Pharaoh given. Well, continuing in verse 16, it details their awful task that they're being asked to do. Verse 16 says, When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Essentially, he's commanding them to, to do a partial birth abortion on the boy. In verse 17, we see that because of their convictions, though, they refused to follow the king's command. Verse 17, it says, The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boy live. Now, don't miss this. Don't miss why they refused to end innocent life. You see it? It says in the text, it says they feared God. They feared God. This is the first time in Exodus that we see the name of God. And they know it would be dishonor, honoring to him if they carried out the king's desires. If we, we also later in the text will read, but in verse 21, we see again where they says they feared God. To fear God is, is to revere him, to, to live in awe of him, to, to submit to him. Church, abortion is ultimately an attack on God, on, on his most prized creation, those whom he created in his image. Despite what we hear in the news, abortion is not simply a social justice issue, even though it certainly is that as well. It's not primarily a political issue or a women's rights issue. The issue is a God issue, and the baby is not just tissue. That's why it, 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 it comes down to the statement of, of fearing God. When we see him for who he is, he, we will understand that by taking any life that he has created, it's an assault on him. And when we revere God, we will be repulsed by evil. We see this in Proverbs 8.13. It says, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and Perverse speech. Listen, if you don't fear God, you will fear someone else. If, if you don't revere God, you'll, you'll revert to, to what's easy. These godly women were so committed to God that there was no way they could take human life. They were living out Proverbs 24, 11. It says, rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. Their commitment makes me think of Acts 5.29, where Peter and the other apostles, it says, replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The king's calling them out in verse 18 and 19. Let's continue back on our text. It says, then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are, are not like Egyptian women. There's, they are vigorous, and they give birth before the midwives arrive. Now, in verse 20 and 21, we read that, that God, God dealt well with the midwives, and his people continued to multiply. It says in, in verses 20 and 21, So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Shifra and Pua. They're the first pro-life heroines in the Bible. And they use their influence to make an impact. I want to 
you about another influencer named Sue Thayer. She started working at an abortion clinic in Iowa many years ago. As part of her training, she would travel to Des, Mo to Des Moines, Iowa to, to watch surgical abortions. They had her in her training observe 25 to 30 abortions a day and, and told her stand against the wall in case she would feel like fainting. Well, in 2007, the, the clinic announced that they would start doing what they were calling webcam abortions. Now, the clinic liked webcam abortions because they didn't have to have a doctor on site. They didn't have to pay for the travel. They didn't have to have security expenses. They didn't have to invest in surgical equipment or, or crash carts. In addition, webcam abortions were the same price as surgical abortions, and so they were making a lot more profit at the clinic. In her writing about this later, she said, when a woman finds out she's pregnant, the staff at the clinic is trained to say, we can take care of the problem today. All you have to do is take some pills. Then ultrasound would be administered, and a doctor sitting in his or her office reads the image on a computer and measures the size of the baby. If the baby is 70 days old, or less. The doctor taps a button on the screen and opens a drawer in the room where the patient is, and then via Skype, sometimes hundreds of miles away, the doctor watches as the woman takes the pill. Then the woman takes some more pills with her, and a couple days later takes those pills, which, which starts the contraction and allows her to deliver the deceased baby. After some time, God convicted Sue, and, and she left her job and began speaking out about what was taking place. In 2011, she organized 40 days of life in front of the clinic where she used to work. On March 1st, 2012, that clinic was closed. There is now a pregnancy resource center in that same community that once housed a, a clinic that killed babies. <coughs> because she feared God, she had no fear about speaking up for those who have no voice. Sue Thayer, once a manager at an abortion clinic, got a new job. She became the lead strategist for Iowa Right to Life. And prior to her dying in 2021 from cancer, in her life she spoke with many politicians. She even testified in Washington, D.C. Jennifer Boham and Bohan Bowen, the newer executive director of the Iowa Right to Life, said this about her. He said, if not for her courage, webcam abortions would have exploded across Iowa and throughout the nation. Further, we have seen Iowa abortion rates plummet 40% since 2007. Now this week, in preparing for this, I, I contacted Grace Haven and talked to them this week. Grace Haven is a clinic, and it's, it's a new facility opened in 2020 in southern Illinois. It's part of the, the Baptist Children and Family Home Services. Grace Haven, um, Grace Haven offers pregnancy testing. They offer training and treatment for STDs. They offer parenting classes. They offer information about adoption. They, they offer um, abortion recovery to mothers. The clinic also has an ultrasound sound machine so parents can see the baby. They can hear the heartbeat without paying a fee. One by one, lives are being saved. They also share with me something I didn't know. This was completely new to me. They talked to me about what is called an abortion reversal pill. If a woman's in her 10th week, week of pregnancy or less, she can take the pill, which we described earlier, that will cause her to abort the baby. This is what we call a medical abortion. When a woman takes that first pill to have the abortion, the pill blocks the baby's own uh, progesterone, and it, it stops the pregnancy from growing. And then she takes pills with her, and, and a couple days later, she takes those pills to complete that abortion at home. Well, again, these second pills are taken a couple days later, and they shared with me that if a woman takes those first pills and then, and then begins to question and decides that it wasn't a good decision, that she can go to some pregnancy resource clinics and be given this abortion pill reversal. These pills are, are progesterone, the hormone that the, that the body makes on its own, and, and it, and that replenishes that, that in the women's body. In the last year, there have been over 3,000 babies in the United States saved through this reversal. Now, those aren't all in Illinois, but that is wonderful news. 3,000 babies saved. So I ask you this morning, are you ready to be like Shifra and Pua from our Bible text and Sue Thayer and do what's right no matter what?
quote Edmund Burke. He said, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men, and I would add, and women, do nothing. Church, we can and we must do something. The next role won't apply to all of us, but will be fulfilled by some. To give birth to babies by being courageous. As we continue in our text, Pharaoh's now, he's, he's amped up because his plans have been thwarted. And, and so he makes this proclamation in verse 22. So then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. This is a direct order to, to all the people. It's very specific. Every son, not most, but every son is to be thrown into the Nile. Now in Exodus 2.1, continuing on, we're introduced to a couple. It says, now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. The Levites were, were set apart for worship and service. And, and look at what happens in verse 2. It says, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she thought, saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. The word fine we have in this text mean, means well-pleasing. When she saw the, the beauty of God's creation, she did everything she could to protect her son. We know from other texts and other passages that her name is Jochebed. At the very minimum, she's facing a, an inconvenient pregnancy. And again, that's, that's minimizing the situation. In all reality, she could have been killed herself if she was found to have kept the baby. What a picture of a mother hiding, protecting her baby. The very heart of a mother is to protect, to nourish her offspring. God saw fit to, to place babies inside the mother's womb because they are most vulnerable. They're, they're dependent at that stage. But unfortunately, in America today, the, the womb has become the most dangerous place for a baby. I encourage moms, be courageous even when it's not convenient. Be courageous even when when it's costly. I love what Warren Wiersbe writes. He says, faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequences. The Bible clearly states and shows us that life begins at conception. We see this in Psalm 139, 13. It says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. We see what, what she does next in verse 3. It says, but when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Think about that for a moment. Think about what these parents were going through. They couldn't, they couldn't hang his diapers and clean them and hang them up on the clothesline. They, they couldn't go and buy food for him at the store. Plus, they had to keep quiet so no one would hear him, hear him crying as well. So she puts him in a basket, which is, by the way, the same word that we see in Genesis 7 is the same word used for ark. Let me pause for a moment. Maybe you're wondering why we would speak about this in church. You know, aren't, we, aren't we speaking to the choir as most Christians wouldn't typically have abortions, would they? Well, actually, one out of every five abortions are performed on women who identify as evangelical Christians. So I ask you this morning, are you in a posture of growing? Will you be like Shifra and Pua and save those who can't save themselves by fearing God? Maybe you're at home or somewhere else listening to this message. If you get pregnant or are pregnant now, I encourage you to give birth by being courageous like Joseph. Use your influence to make an impact. The third role is where the majority of us will find ourselves. Number three is be an advocate by staying close to someone in need. In verse four, we're introduced to Miriam, the sister of Moses. It says his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. She knows that, that Moses is in a basket among the reeds, so she stays close. By the way, she may have been only 10 or 12 or, or at least at very most a young teenager at this point. And notice the irony of what happens next. This can only be described as God's 
providence as we look at verses 5 and 6. It says, Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Miriam, she jumps into action at this point, and, and she uses words that are both wise and, and that are respectful. As we look at verse 7, it says, Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Notice her, her emphasis is on the princess at this time, not, not on the baby. She says, call you a nurse to, to, to help you, for you. Miriam, she's, she's watchful, she's creative, she's inventive, she's available, she's faithful. She's cordial, but she's also nearby, she's present. We can call this the practice of the principle of proximity. We have to be near someone in order to help them when they're in need. It, it's when we're close that we can reach out in a crisis. It's one reason we talk about getting to know our neighbors. If, if we hang out with our neighbors, we get to know them. When they'll possibly reach out to us when they're hurting. It's that time that we can help our neighbors. It also means that in order to do that, we have to get out of, of Christian cocoons and not just spend time with those who are like us and talk like us and act like us. Get to know those in your neighborhood, in your, in your friends, your family. Get to know people. Step outside of your comfort zone. Because Miriam stayed close, she was able to speak up and speak into this crisis situation. She's living out Proverbs 31.8 that says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Maybe today someone's listening to this message and having just learned about the abortion pill reversal and, and is considering that now. Maybe someone needs to, to connect with Grace Haven or, or another resource. Church, be available to people who are hurting and are in need. God calls each of us to be advocates by staying close to people in need. Again, use your influence to make an impact. Now, there's a fourth role in this passage. Use your platform to protect life by living on mission. Pharaoh's daughter, Bethiah. She represents someone in a position of power who used her platform to protect life. We see where she's moved with compassion. When she opens up this basket, she sees this, this crying child and, and she feels sorry for him. It's one of the Hebrew babies, she says. The word for crying here is, is wailing or weeping. The little guy is in deep distress. And when she hears his helpless cry, she's committed to help. By the way, that's why we're committed to helping people with, with view of ultrasounds of their babies. It's a modern day of way of opening the basket. Once a baby's seen, a woman's naturally inclined to save a life. But when I spoke to the workers at Grace Haven this week, they told me that up to 88% of women choose life after hearing the heartbeat. After Miriam comes up with the idea to have her mother, to have the mother of Moses, care for the baby, Matthias says in verse 8 and 9. Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. Joke about it. She's not only able to nurse her son, but also nurture him during his formative years. The funny part is that she gets paid to do so. <laughs> How ironic that, that Pharaoh, who, who called for killing of the boys, he ends up paying the mother of Moses to raise her own son. Don't miss the importance of this as, as, she, had, as she had time with Moses to teach him about the ways of God. We read in Hebrews 11, 27 that, that his faith was strong. It says, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. Maybe you're a mother and you need help in this way. Know there are options. In addition to Grace Haven, there's also Angels Cove, a, a residency program center also in Mount Vernon and part of that Baptist Children's Home and Family Services. In the providence of God, we read verse 10. 
says, when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. More irony here. Ironically, Moses ends up leading his people out of the water when they flee from Egypt. He was drawn out so he could draw others out. One of Pharaoh's own children delivers a Hebrew child who would later deliver God's children from bondage in Egypt. God uses one from the house of the seed of the serpent to help deliver the seed of the woman. I know that's hard to, to wrap our mind around to, to understand what all's taking place in that text, but notice God works throughout history in ways we would never imagine. Interestingly, Moses is given a great education because he's the grandson of Pharaoh. He receives military and, and administrative training, which later helps him lead the Israelites. Only God can do this. He has a plan. He loves to bring good out of bad. Let me tell you about someone else. A man by the name of Bernard Nathanson. His first involvement with abortion was as a medical student in Montreal in 1945. His girlfriend became pregnant. He scheduled, he financed an illegal abortion at that time. In 1970, when New York legalized abortion, he became the director of the largest abortion clinic in the world when he saw over 75, he administered over 75,000 abortions. Sorry, he oversaw 75,000. He personally performed over 5,000, including one of his own children. By 1974, a year after Roe versus Wade, Nathanson began to question whether that fetus was just an undifferentiated, undifferentiated mass of cells or, or if it was really developing into a human being. He was becoming increasingly sure that, that abortion was, and in fact, a death not merely a medical procedure, yet he continued. He continued to perform, and, and he remained convinced that abortion was a legitimate, legitimate solution to a woman's personal problem. In the 1970s, though, a new technology was, reduced, re, was introduced in the United States that would change him forever, the ultrasound. For him, the ultrasound made it impossible to deny, to deny that abortion was anything other than a deliberate killing of a human being. Using ultrasound technology, he would later produce a pro-life documentary called The Silent Scream with film footage of an actual abortion. He explained, he said, these ultrasound technologies and apparatuses and machines, which we now use every day, have convinced us that beyond question, an unborn child is simply another human being, another member of the human community, indistinguishable in every way from any of us. Now, for the first time, we have the technology to see abortion from the victim's vantage point. Ultrasound imaging has allowed us to see this. Nathan said he, he spends the rest of his life fighting pro-abortion laws that he had helped put in place. Like the daughter of Pharaoh, he used his platform to protect life. You can do the same. If you're in the medical profession or a counselor or a teacher, you have tremendous influence. If you're in high school or college, you can choose professions where you can live on mission by standing for, up for life. In all reality, every profession can be used as a platform to protect life. Here are some other ways you can leverage your position. Give resources to support life. Vote for candidates who support life. Be open to adopting or, or to having foster parents. Consider serving as a safe family by being temporary parents for mothers in crisis. One of the workers from Grace Haven said, I want to tell you about a story. Just recently, a woman that, that I worked with, she, the woman was, when came in initially a few months, a number of months ago, and she was leaning toward abortion when she, she first came here. And she, after seeing the ultrasound and hearing the heartbeat, she began to have second thoughts. Consider the, the center provided resources to her and information, and, and they showed her love. Praise God, she changed her mind. And that she's due later this month in January now. The woman at Grace Haven was so excited that this baby is going to be born. You may be thinking, well, does that really make a difference? I mean, that's one child. Are we even making any difference at all? Listen to this. 
In 1973, I'm going to give you some history, the Supreme Court legalized abortion in all states. This divided the country, you most people know this, divided into the pro-abortion and the pro-life groups. In 1973, initially, it was limited the first three months of pregnancy, but in 1992, abortion became a constitutional right. In the years since, some states, such as Illinois and New York, have changed their laws to allow abortion up to the ninth month while others have tried to eliminate abortion. There are four states that have only one abortion clinic. They're North Dakota, South Dakota, Dakota, Mississippi, and Missouri. But here's where things may be changing. Just this past December, a month ago, the U.S. Supreme Court heard oral argument against a Mississippi state law which limits abortion after the 15th week of pregnancy, and, and many believe that the court, which hasn't made a ruling yet, will overturn Roe versus Wade this year. Now, if, overturn, if it's overturned, help, let me help you understand what that means. It doesn't mean that abortion goes away overnight, but it would in many states. Illinois is, is already an abortion destination. And if it went away in many of these other states, almost every state that borders Illinois would possibly see an elimination of, abort of abortion, and we would see people coming to Illinois for abortion. Some of the numbers of Illinois suggest that, that whereas we see about 100,000 abortions in the state of Illinois, if Roe versus Wade goes away, we could see as many as 7 million abortions in our state a year. When abortion clinics closed a, a couple years ago in the St. Louis area, a new, a new clinic opened up. One of the largest in the country it was built in Fairview Heights, right across from, from St. Louis, not far from where I grew up. And they put billboards up on the bridge. As you come in from Missouri, there were billboards that say, Welcome to Illinois, where abortion is still legal. So abortion is not going to go away anytime soon, especially in Illinois. But, but the New York Times reported a, stu a study by Middleburg College, the University of California in San Francisco, and the Guttmacher Institution. They found that, that without Roe, the, the number of legal abortions in our country would fall by at least 14%. 14%, that's great news. Almost overnight, 14% of abortions could go away. Research shows that roughly half of the women who would be unable to access a legal abortion would probably instead bear the children. There's also another bill being considered that would allow the, the pills that, that are administered for an abortion to be able to just be ordered by mail as well. Again, a lot of things change. The CDC reports that, that the abortion rate today is the lowest since 1973, and I believe one reason is because so many are fulfilling the role that God has called us to fill. I ask you today, where are the mighty men? Where are the mighty men in our society? 2 Samuel 23 describes a group of mighty men who stepped up to the plate to serve King David. I believe God is looking for mighty men who will serve King Jesus and protect and preserve life. Hebrews 11.23 tells us that, that both of Moses' parents stepped up. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edge. It's interesting that both Pharaoh and Herod murdered male babies. Why? One pastor put it like this. He said, if you minimize the male, you can master the nation. Church, it's time for men to man up to speak up, to show up, to stand up. Men, I charge you from, from 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong. The Holman Christian Standard Bible puts that verse this way. It says, be alert, stand firm in the faith, act like a man, be strong. What about it? What about it? You are made for greatness. Use your position. Stop being passive. We were born to defend women, to defend children, including the preborn. We're not to sit idly by when we know that lives are at stake. Will you protect? Will you provide? Again, what role will you play? Travis Peterson, he writes about this. He says, while you may be able to make arguments as to how other social issues are important, the fact still remains that there, 
that the intentional slaughter of 3,000 children per day is a great evil that no reasonable person can deny. Notice this next part when he, uh, he's writing. This is written a number of years ago before we had COVID. He said, if the swine flu, he uses it for example, if the swine flu were killing 3,000 people a day, the nation would be moving heaven and earth to put a stop to it. If, 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 if Islam terrorists were able to kill 3,000 Americans a day, people would be screaming for military in intervention at the highest level. Church, we often look at horrific injustices in the past, like the Holocaust or, or slavery or, or racial segregation, and we assume that, well, if we were there, if they were part of that, we would have, would have hidden the Jews in our home, or, or we would have helped run the Underground Railroad, or, or we would have marched at Selma. Church, we have an, an opportunity, an opportunity to use our influence to make an impact. Who do you identify in, in this pro-life narrative? Are you ready to use your role as God writes up his story for his glory? You can make a great impact. Like Shifra and Pua, save those who can't save themselves by fearing God. Like Jochebed, give birth to babies by being courageous. Like Miriam, be an advocate by staying close to someone in need. And like Matthias, use your platform to protect those lives by living on mission. God was preparing a way to save people through the birth of a baby boy. Truth is that we're all guilty of, of killing the truly innocent child, the, the son of God. It was our sin that, that sent him to that cross, and it was his death that set us free. It's only through that gift of receiving Christ as our Lord and Savior and repenting of our sins and beginning to live for him that we can have eternal life with him. Maybe you're listening to this message and, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We invite you to begin that walk today. To confess your sin and begin that walk. Doesn't mean you get your life all straightened out and get everything perfect and then you come to Christ. No. You come in your mess. You accept him. And you allow him to help you walk, walk through and straighten out the mess at that point. I ask you, will you receive the, the free gift of salvation by repenting and receiving him into your life. Maybe you've, you've done that in the past, but, but you've never been baptized. We invite you to come, and, and be, I'd love to talk to you about that and begin that conversation as, as we schedule a baptism. Maybe you're a baptized believer and you've been worshiping with us, but, but you've never joined the church and you want to do that today. Hear me, there's nothing that's going to save you about joining our church. We love for people to join our church. We love to, to join in fellowship, and we'll encourage you, and we'll try to support you in your walk with Christ. We would love you to come and join the church. But the most important decision, if you've never committed your life to Christ, is to do so. It's not about joining a church. It's about committing your life to him. Again, it's not about me convincing you to do something. It's about you being obedient. To what you sense God leading you to do. I'm going to invite our, our music leaders back up. If you're able, please stand with us. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. A day with a a sermon that's different than we typically preach, but a sermon that is no less important. Lord, help us to grow from this, Lord. To understand that, that we can help save those that can't save themselves. Help us to be advocates. To use influence and platforms to protect lives. Most of all, in this very moment, I ask that you speak to hearts. For any that are listening that do not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that this would be the day. They would step out in faith and they would pray to you and they would commit their life to you and their life would never be the same from this point forward. Lord, we love you and we praise you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.